Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Simon Morrison, and I teach here at Princeton University, both in the music department and in the Slavic department. Um, I'm here to, first of all, uh, welcome you all and to thank the sponsors of this event, which include the program in Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, as well as my own department. Uh, this is a webinar, so following the uh, short presentation from our special guest, um, there will be a question and answer session which uh, Professor uh, Yekaterina Pravilova and I will moderate. So we'll alternate reading the questions aloud for our speaker to answer. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn um, the discussion over to Professor Pravilova who will introduce our speaker. Uh, good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to introduce Leonid Volkov. He's the chief of staff of Alexei Navalny political campaign. Let me explain very briefly. Alexei Navalny now is not just a name or person. He has become a political brand in a good sense and a symbol. And in every city, every town maybe in Russia, there exists an Stab Navalnyva, Navalny's headquarter or regional organization that coordinates the activity of Alexei Navalny's supporters, local election, the campaign, the smart vote campaign. So Leonid Volkov coordinates this large network of regional organizations. And despite the name Stab Navalnyva, these organizations do not only prepare or advocate for Navalny's election, either as a president or a mayor or something else, but they also pursue various local or regional initiatives. Besides that, uh, Leonid Volkov also runs an organization, the Society for the Protection of Internet. He has a YouTube channel very useful where he publishes weekly updates. I uh, highly recommend them. In 2018, Lenit Volker was a participant of the Maurice Greenberg World Fellows Program. And the same year, he also visited Princeton. So it's not his first Princeton visit, but this time is only virtual. Lenit currently lives in Lithuania because of the criminal allegations made against him by the state. Uh, in 2019, 2021, uh, due to his political activity, if I'm not mistaken, Lenny, correct me uh, if I'm wrong, that you were accused of um, calling people for illegal political activities, uh, illegal political action, actions. So uh, I could not think of a better person to tell us about the future of political activism and political opposition in Russia. And we invited Lenny Volkov to speak what is going to happen after Navalny's imprisonment. So, Denith, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's very late in Lithuania and Vilnius. Uh, we're all looking forward to your speech. Yeah, uh, Simon, Katerina, thanks a lot for inviting me and for hosting me uh, at this event. I have to admit that I a little bit overestimated my ability to talk at like half past 11 p.m. Uh, local time here in Vilnius. I'll try to do my best, but of course now I'm only dreaming about jumping as fast as possible to the Q&A session where, you know, I feel myself very confident uh, and like to skip the presentation part. But of course I'll, I'll do my best still. Uh, so, but I'll try to spare as much time as possible for the Q&A still. So, uh, my great pleasure and honor to talk at Princeton. Indeed, I've been there like two years ago uh, in December 2018 by invitation of Professor Alec Itzhoki, uh, then at Princeton now, University of California, Los Angeles, Professor of Economics. We had a very nice discussion and I can only dream about coming to Princeton offline once again. I hope this soon will happen. Uh, but still, better is this than nothing, <clears throat> so I'm delighted to talk to this audience. Uh, and the main message, so if I'm allowed, like, if I would be allowed to give only, like, one message or only one idea during my presentation, is that it's, it's, you know, always the, the current situation in Russia should be always observed using at least two sets of optics. 
like you always have to zoom in and zoom out. You always have to concentrate not only about like the current events, but uh, also on, on the broader perspective. So Putin tries to tell us the story using like the very local, very focused optics. He tries to convince us there is no hope because I mean, the protests have been mm, beaten down. 12,000 people detained in end of January 2021 in what was the like largest wave of repression in our country since Stalin era. Opposition leaders either arrested or in exile or under home arrest <clears throat> in Moscow, like Lyubov Sobol uh, and others. Uh, no one will be allowed, it's quite clear that no one will be allowed to participate in the upcoming Duma elections. Putin just passed the constitutional amendments, which effectively allow him to stay in power forever, like, okay, until 2036, but then he will also have plenty of time to invent something. So, if we, if we put together all these messages, we could feel desperate. And that's what Putin, of course, would like us to feel. <laughs> but then we, we zoom out a little bit and try to consider a situation from, from, from a broader perspective. And what we see, well, first of all, <clears throat> our movement, we always uh, thought, we, we always knew, first of all, that our um, strategy is is a long run, of course. We there should not be and could not be like one single event that would just allow us to to defeat Putin. Putin is strong. I mean, he he has all his law enforcement agencies, all the Siloviki. Uh, he has all the power, all the money, enormous resources. Like he outnumbers us in terms of resources and like several degrees. So he has like all possibilities <clears throat> in the country. So we always um, had the strategy of like building up our movement, of growing our movement, like from 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 grassroots, from regions, from from down to uh, uh, to high. So and actually, they succeeded. When Alexei Navalny started his like active political career, when we started to work together, like back back in 2011, 10 years ago, so before the uh, Duma elections of 2011, when, when he started his first nationwide famous campaign, like not a single word to the party of crooks and thieves, to Putin's party United Russia, when he launched the anti-corruption foundation, when he launched launched Rospil, his initiative to investigate corruption uh, in procurement 10 years ago, he had maybe 50 or 100,000 followers. Maybe a couple of thousand people in the country were aware about like who he is. Then we used Moscow mayoral campaign to increase his visibility dramatically. And after Moscow mayoral campaign, we had maybe around 1 million followers. Then we used the presidential, then, then, then YouTube appeared. Our first experiments with YouTube started in 2015 with a famous uh, movie Chaika about the then prosecutor general. It was 2015, six years ago. Um, then uh, the presidential campaign that we launched in December 2016 and that lasted through 2017 with the Medvedev investigation and with building the network of regional offices. It's, this is when Alexei Navalny started to be followed by the FSB poisoner's squad, by the way, because he started to reach out to regions and he uh, stated that he is not ready to stay in this like ghetto, this electoral ghetto of, of Moscow upper middle class hipsters, uh, which was like a safe house where he was allowed to operate always. But he stated very clearly 
that's not enough for him. And he started to reach out to build regional offices all over the country. We managed to prove and to show that there is a huge deal of demand for independent politics in Russian regions, that people are ready to are ready for independent politics, that people are ready to turn out for rallies. During 2017, we visited, along with the FSB squad, uh, over 70 Russian cities. We held a huge number of rallies. The largest rallies in terms of turnout, in terms of like um, percentage of city populations turning out for a rally to, to meet Alexei Navalny, were in Murmansk and Smolensk, two small cities never visible before on Russian political map. So our movement was not anymore about the wealthy hipsters within the garden ring. It, we managed to prove we are able to reach out to wider audiences. And uh, after the presidential campaign in 2018, we had a daily audience of about four or five million people. So when Alexei or someone else of our team wanted to say something, Five million people approximately would listen to it or read it or uh, watch it within the next few days. <clears throat> now, in 2020, after the uh, whole story about the poisoning uh, that he uh, that he escaped in a way that couldn't be described in other words, words but but miracle. Uh, after the investigation of this poisoning and after his return and the, of course, after the Putin Palace video, we now enjoy an audience of about like 15 to 20 million people, which never happened, which are already compared, comparable with the audience of like uh, main TV channels. So actually, actually, if you zoom out and consider like uh, the, the time uh, period of 10 years, then we see that we managed to grow like a hundredfold. So uh, like achievement comparable with that of Tesla. So it's, it's actually very impressive, especially given the circumstances, given what's going on in the Russian political market where people get beaten down and arrested and harassed for 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 any attempt to participate in independent politics and still we manage to multiply the number of our supporters by hundreds of times like three or four times since 2018 so it's quite obvious that we if we manage to continue at a similar pace for a couple of years more we will like outnumber putin and very dramatically. We actually already do among young audience. We see that among uh, voters like 18 to 29, uh, Navalny's approval rating is higher than, than Putin's for the first time. So, and this denotes that we are targeting the political future. Well, Navalny himself, he's imprisoned. He is uh, now undergoing like very severe and harsh imprisonment. He was unlawfully sentenced. He will spend at least, I mean, Putin hopes, he will spend the next two years and a half in prison. And of course, it's not all. They are already preparing another case and another case. And I mean, Putin's plan is to keep him, uh, to keep Navalny uh, in prison like forever. And if we zoom in, it is very dramatic, and it is. But if you zoom out a little bit, then what we actually see? Well, before Navalny uh, returned to Russia, but after he announced that he will soon return, we already told, and it was very clear for everyone, and many analysts also told this, that, well, this actually puts Putin in quite of a tsukzwang, and in a very unpleasant situation, in that corner where Putin prefers not to be because he's left with two options and each of these options is not really very pleasant for him to let Navalny go which we which would be to show to prove his 
weakness uh, in front of his like cronies and the lies and his team uh, because and Putin's team because well Navalny published this video about the palace. Navalny has proven that Putin ordered him to be poisoned. Navalny publicly accused Putin of this poisoning and then to let him walk away that's, that would of, uh, apparently mean that Putin is very weak and very afraid of him. But the other option to imprison Navalny would also be bad. It would definitely ignite the protests and this happened. This would definitely make Navalny political prisoner number one in the world and this happened. This would definitely make Nav the case Navalny the issue number one in international relations for, for a long period of time and this is happening. And this, is, this will create a very severe long-term problem for Putin because, I mean, when Navalny is in prison, uh, Putin's ability to throw dirt on him, to uh, blame him on everything is very limited. I mean, he's in prison. You can't use your television to accuse him for, for I don't know, like getting funds from 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 a State Department, George Soros or, or the Martians. You can't accuse him of having, I don't know, like uh, sex with five women simultaneously or whatever. He's in prison. He's in your custody. He very naturally becomes a symbol, a vivid symbol and, and point of like attraction of uh, crystallization for any protest movement. So anyone who doesn't like Putin for this or that reason would very naturally see Navalny as a possible uh, leader they could stick together with. We have seen it from, from, from the Mandela story, from Aung San Suu Kyi story, both of them were not that popular as they be, have became uh, at the beginning of their present terms. Of course, we hope that uh, Navalny will not spend their 20, 28 years like Mandela did and, uh, or 20 years that Aung San Suu Kyi has spent under home arrest. Uh, things are now moving faster in the 21st century. But in general, uh, with Navalny imprisoned, uh, Putin created a huge and long-lasting problem problem for himself. And of course, we are to do at every conversation, uh, every Putin's conversation with any world leader in the foreseeable future will start with the discussion about Navalny and when he will be released. And the world could be quite efficient at this. So actually, Putin didn't get rid of a problem. He created a huge problem for him. And if we zoom out a little bit, we could be quite optimistic about the situation, which is which may which may sound a little bit strange given all the circumstances, but but still we are. And of course, we knew what we are doing. I mean, Navalny when he uh, uh, made his decision. To come back. Of course, he calculated these possible scenarios, and we are now definitely within a scenario that we have um, uh, considered as quite likely, and we were like morally and politically prepared. Now, 2021 is, in, uh, is <clears throat> 2021 is a year of a national election. <clears throat> we'll have Duma elections in September. And it's a very special election. It's not a Duma, it's the Duma that will uh, sit also in 2024 in the year of transition. No matter if this will be a transition from Putin to someone else or a transition of Putin to Putin, still it will be a very problematic transition for Kremlin for Putin, as they have learned it also from <clears throat> Lukashenko's experience in August 2020. Putin's approval rating is going down, and this is fundamental. So there is no fundamental reason 
for a situation to get better. So uh, the economy is deteriorating. The household income decreases for eight for eight years in a row now. Uh, Putin is there for 21 years now. Everyone is very tired of him. And this, this fundamental reason for uh, dissent and unrest will not disappear. Navalny in prison, another reason for protest will also not uh, disappear apparently in the nearest future. <laughs> Uh, the uh, United Russia, United Russia's Putin's party approval ratings are at historical lows right now, and there is no reason why they uh, might improve. And so, uh, with Putin's own approval rating, so they are actually facing a very challenging collections, despite the fact that you know. Elections are rigged and manipulated with in Russia. Still, every electoral event is quite unpleasant for Kremlin because they can't win anything. They can only lose. They have all the power. They have all the resources. They have the, the vast majority in the Duma. They have all the necessary seats. They have all the money. They can't win anything. And still they are forced to play a game where they can't win but can only lose which is of course not pleasant which is of course stressful and being put under stress people tend to make mistakes and we'll see a lot of mistakes um, during the Kremlin's Duma campaign in 2021 and during the Kremlin's presidential campaign of 2024. So now it is very important for Putin to get a very uh, stable and controlled Duma in 2021. But given the current United Russia approval ratings, this also becomes very much of a challenge. And also if we zoom out once again and uh, consider the situation like from a historical perspective, well, the 2011 Duma elections already caused very massive protests and like, well, have put us very close to a revolution or at least like a regime change. Uh, then, uh, and in 2011, Putin and United Russia were doing much better than they, uh, they are doing now. And the civil society in 2011 was not prepared. So people were not ready for, you know, street protests, unsanctioned rallies. People were not ready to uh, fines, to arrests, to repressions, to being beaten down and so on. Now people are ready and we have seen it <clears throat> in uh, January 2021 when actually uh, the protests were much more massive than in December 2011. And this in a very different situation because in December 2011 the rallies were sanctioned. Uh, so people did not face any risk when turning out. And even if they would be detained, then the maximum fine for participation in the sanction rally back in 2011 was 500 rubles. Seven dollars. Now it's 300,000. So, which is like more like, yeah, five thousand dollars. So, it's, it's a very dramatic difference. And still, we've seen a uh, turnout in 2021 larger than in 2011. Uh, then there was a Duma election of 2016 that was the most smooth and silent and, um, and good for Putin. He did not face any obstacles, but it was after Crimea, after the, the political effect of an annexation of Crimea did not yet fade out and so on. Uh, and we did not have a strategy for 2016. Now we have a proven strategy. We have our smart voting that we already employed twice for the regional elections of 2019 and 2020, both times very successful. We managed to unseat about 20% of incumbent United Russia candidates in both 
regional elections of 2019 and 2020 in very different regions of the country, which was, yes, well, a major success. We now have like a technology that works and we have a proof for this. So we know how to organize the voters, how to uh, use smart voting and yeah, how to defeat uh, incumbent United Russia uh, members of the parliament. So all this also makes us actually quite optimistic also about the outcome of the ongoing Duma elections. We will have our candidates very probably that no one of our candidates will be admitted even to be on the ballot. And this is not a huge, great deal of a problem for us because we will then employ smart voting and still will make the new parliament much more competitive, much less uniform than the current one. And this will create for Putin a huge deal of trouble before the transition in 2024. So, once again, back to our uh, thesis where we started. Putin is always trying to use a very local optics to convince us the situation is desperate. Navalny imprisoned, protests beaten down. We don't have to uh, expect anything. The election will be rigged. There is no sense to participate. Putin is forever. Putin wants to stay forever. That's true. But we also knew that Putin wanted to make Russia one of the top five economies in the world. He announced it and promised it publicly many times. He didn't manage. Putin wanted to kill Alexei Navalny. He didn't manage. So Putin definitely wants to stay in power forever. But if he will manage, it's actually an open question. And if we zoom out a little bit, then we see so that our movement is as large, as strong as it never has been. We have a very clear strategy for the upcoming collection. And this is a working strategy. We uh, have grown approval rating for Alexei Navalny, even when he is in prison. We are at record highs of his approval rating. And the trend is very good. And while he stays in prison, actually, uh, the trend will be very positive because he will, of course, attract a lot of compassion and sympathy. And I mean, he will not do any mistakes. You can't do a mistake. You can't do a political mistake uh, while you are imprisoned. For very many people, he will become uh, the, the symbol of a hope for change. And for very natural, like, while well, biological, generational reasons, more and more people will uh, seek for uh, change and will demand uh, change. And this, of course, will help the change to happen. Having said that, so uh, having like put it on a like historical timeline and having stressed that uh, the uh, broader perspective is always a source of great optimism for us and the reason why our movement actually like keeps going despite all the obstacles and challenges. Of course, I have to admit that we cannot promise that Putin will be gone in, in a year or two. He still has unlimited resources. He still is very strong. It is very much possible that he will be able to last for, for a few years, even for many years. Uh, we always considered our strategy and uh, the, 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 the uh, well, fight of our movement to be like a very long run, long term. We never did promise that, you know, just like one last effort and he will go. To promise something like this would be irresponsible. Uh, we know that many uh, authoritarian regimes, si very similar to Putin's, managed to survive uh, until the death of 
of their authoritarian leader, unfortunately. And unfortunately, this is a possible scenario for Putin's Russia. We are very sure that Putinism will not survive after Putin because it's all built on like personal ties and relations and personal obligations. Uh, and when Putin is gone, for whatever reason, all his cronies and allies will that hate each other will start a huge fight against each other and this will create an enormous opportunity for our movement. Our strategy was always to be the largest and best organized political force in the country to be able to get the power in any transitional situation, in any situation of whenever any like window of opportunities would open. Uh, Putin's death, for whatever reason, could open such a window of opportunities. Uh, some attempted coup or like uh, conflict among his closest allies could be such an opportunity. Or some black swan type event, like the Arab Spring, which started with a kind of like random event 10 years ago in uh, Tunisia. Something that no one could forecast, no one could expect. In any case, whatever would happen, we have to be prepared, we have to be organized, we have to be strong. And that's why we continue building up our political organization. We will be opening new regional offices this year. We will be recruiting new volunteers, new supporters. We will use the electoral campaign to reach out to more people. We will continue to building up our audience, to growing our audience, to, to, to get from, I don't know, from the current 15 million daily audience to 30, 40, or uh, <clears throat> wherever possible. This is a long-term strategy, which doesn't promise uh, immediate successes and results. But I very much believe this will bring us to the beautiful, metaphoric Russia of the future quite soon. So thank you, and let's jump to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Leonid. Um, uh, as noted, uh, I'll ask questions in alternation with uh, Yekaterina. So um, the first question uh, comes from Peter Weiss. Um, questions are coming here both on the question and answer and the chat <laughs> feed and Q&A is probably the easiest for us to navigate. Um, but the first question concerns whether uh, Navalny would have been better able to lead his movement had he not returned to Russia and faced prison, uh, would he have been able to communicate more freely with other members of opposition? Yeah, uh, Peter, thank, thank you for a question. But uh, there is one thing that I want to stress here, that there was never a discussion about whether or not to return. Well, actually, I mean, uh, uh, this, this is, I, I feel, I have, um, I have faced this question many times with, with the press, for instance. Like, there is a perception that there was some type of a discussion, like that we had some meeting and we have tried to compare like upsides and downsides of his return. That is not true, of course. Navalny is the leader of Russian political opposition. He always, like he belonged there, he never considered other options. And even when he was in coma, no one of, of his team, of people who are his friends and he, who know him very good, ever considered any other options. Of course, we knew that once he wakes up, his first thing will be to go back to Russia because, well, he belongs there and it's not possible to be a political leader from abroad. So I am a political manager. So I'm running the network of regional offices. So, and for my office in Khabarovsk or in Chelyabinsk, it's, it doesn't matter where I am on Zoom call uh, from them from Yale, like in 2018 when I was a Greenberg World Fellow at Yale, or from Moscow, 
or from Vilnius or from elsewhere. And, you know, the, the, the COVID year has teached us all to be uh, omnipresent and uh, always <coughs> available and, and so on. But Navalny is not a manager, he's a leader. We have, I mean, we have, we have a quite large and operative political structure. We have like 250 paid staff. So it has a good deal of bureaucracy. We have some like chain of command, some like managers who report to other managers who report to me and, and so on. It, and it is very important that this political organization keeps up and running. So um, because, you know, we have to organize rallies, we have to like print campaign literature, we have to have like lawyers for uh, elections and, you know, web designers and IT people who develop like our websites and maintain our websites and people who do like, who manage mailing lists and people who work with volunteers and regions and uh, who help regional office and so on, so on, so on, so on. This is the operational structure. Navalny was never part of it. He's a political leader. He formulates ideas. He, uh, well, he, he, he thinks, he leads, he inspires people uh, and so on. And this is something that you just can't do from uh, exile. It's, uh, it's not possible. And I mean, this was never a subject of discussion. We always knew that we have to keep our political structure um, operative, our political organization operative, and we, and we do. But for him, of course, it was the only possible option to return, to, to show his like personal bravery, to continue his fight. He did nothing wrong. He did not violate any Russian law. So why shouldn't he go back? Why shouldn't he like stay abroad after his treatment was finished, after he rehabilitated from the poison. And I knew very good that now, I mean, there in, in the panel colony, of course, in, in very harsh conditions, he is still very confident that he did everything correct. Also because he realized that he was putting Putin in a very unpleasant situation, that he made Putin to face a very unpleasant choice. Well, Putin has made his choice to imprison Navalny, but as I already tried to explain, this doesn't actually make the situation uh, look easier for Putin. Um, thank you, Leonid. So you mentioned in the beginning of the, your talk how important uh, was for you for your campaign uh, the use of media like YouTube and internet that help you rise the number of supporters uh, and hundreds of times. Michael David Fox is asking, how much of a danger do you think are the Russian government's attempts to control the internet as China does in the Great Firewall? Uh, this is a good question. That, that's why I launched my like pet project, the Internet Protection Society back in 2015. We wanted to see what actually Putin, what, what Putin actually could do uh, to have internet under his control. And uh, Putin, of course, pays a great deal of attention to, uh, to spread his uh, monopoly over media also uh, to the realm of, uh, of the internet. So far, unsuccessful. Because fortunately, the Russian internet is very free by design. The Russian internet is uh, has emerged in the 90s like the Chinese. Uh, but in Russia, the 90s were the time of the largest, of the greatest possible freedom. While in China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party was uh, controlling everything just like it does now. So China has built its uh, great firewall from the beginning. Uh, China has mm, two numbers are very important to understand uh, the situation. Three and 917. 
three is the number of the transborder uh, connection points between the Chinese internet and the outer world. Like they have three um, internet service providers, China Telecom, China Mobile and China Unicom, which have transborder links. And there are only three of them. Russia has 917 transborder, transborder links because like the, the topology of the Russian internet uh, has emerged, has evolved, was created in the 90s. And it's very like well connected, it's very free and so on. So you can't now just put uh, the, the, the uh, technical solution like the Chinese create firewall atop of the topology of the existing Russian internet. It, they, they try to do a lot for the internet censorship and so on, but it's technically much more complicated for them as it was in China. And uh, so the Internet Protection Society does a lot to, uh, to monitor how things are going. We are doing a lot of research on, like, on connectivity, on uh, internet censorship. And I would say, so far, so good. So far, all the attempts of uh, the Russian government to uh, make uh, Russian internet like less free have failed. Uh, the most uh, known case, the, the most, well, the, the most public case was the, their attempt to shut down Telegram back in 2018, which failed completely. And in China, they would succeed. But in Russia, that failed because of the existing existing topology of the Russian internet. So it was technically not possible for them to, to, block, uh, uh, to, to block Telegram. And it's, for instance, technically not possible for them uh, to block YouTube in Russia. Well, of course, the, the situation is getting worse, but we are monitoring it and it's, ma it's very far from, 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 the, uh, from the Chinese. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is, I suppose, a related question. Um, it moves from the internet to the streets. And uh, Andre Naumov asks about the possibility or the probability of a potential um, multifaceted crackdown on the opposition, as in Belarus. And the um, what is the most efficient response to such a crackdown if it were to occur? Yeah, uh, Andre, thank you also for this question. So, uh, Putin is politically Lukashenko's younger brother. So very many bad practices from Belarus have been inherited in Russia. Uh, Lukashenko came to power six years earlier than Putin, and Putin learned many lessons from him, uh, including very many laws against like peaceful protesters. For instance, Lukashenko made protesters pay for the rallies, you know, for the, for the working hours of police force uh, who kind of guard the rallies of opposition back in 2011, I think. Putin first adopted this practice in 2017 uh, when people started to become fined for, you know, for the uh, excess use of the police. <laughs> uh, during the rallies and so on. So which happened first in St. Petersburg and now and then very massively after Moscow protests of summer 2019. So this this gap of six years pretty much existed like always. So which something bad happened in Belarus, one could expect that this would also be adopted in Russia within like five, six years. Now this gap has suddenly uh, uh, come to be like only six months. Yeah, so what we've seen in Minsk in August, we pretty much seen the same uh, in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, end of January this year. So uh, Lukashenko has uh, teached Putin one more lesson that, you know, in the middle of Europe, in the 21st century, you just have you just could just beat down people like very uh, harshly, very severely, and still 
go away with this, walk away with this. Unfortunately, I mean, we were following the, the events of August and September in Belarus very closely because we, we all knew if the revolution in Belarus would win, would prevail, this would also very much limit Putin in its future actions. That would very clearly designate borders that Putin will red lines that Putin would never dare to cross. But if Lukashenko manages to stay in power after everything he has committed, then of course this will be also very bad news very bad news for Putin, uh, for Russia, very bad signal, very clear signal for Putin. And this actually happened. So I, I think that Putin would not dare for such a harsh response that he has ordered uh, in January if he wouldn't have seen what happened in Belarus in, in summer. So of course, we also have to adopt our strategy to what happened. And this is, for instance, uh, where our decision uh, to put protests on hold originated because we saw that if we just continue uh, to to uh, to call people to turn out every next every other week, then Putin would continue to beat them down, and this will lead to a huge disappointment. And the number will decrease, the protests will fade out, and people will realize that you know everything is hopeless and so on. So we decided, we were very much criticized for this decision, but we very much having taken into account the Belarusian experience, we have decided that we uh, put the protests on hold on the, like, when there were, like, on the, on the, on, on, on the top level, not, not already fading out to the bottom. Uh, I, th I think, I think this is, this is quite important. So uh, now what we also have learned is that we really have to try to uh, organize uh, rallies that one couldn't uh, beat down. And we have some ideas for this. So for instance, even our mm, uh, rally of February 14th, well, which was not a real rally when we asked people to just uh, go to their courtyards with some light and find the neighbors, the like-minded name, uh, neighbors. It was also inspired partly by the event in Belarus because we wanted to show that it is possible to organize a street protest in such a form that it couldn't be... Uh, uh, well, uh, destroyed this, this, this police force. Now we have another idea, which is not uh, learned from, uh, which, 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 which is not taken from Belarus. We will announce that soon, I hope, in less than two weeks. We, we believe we have found a formula uh, of to, of, for how to organize the rally that couldn't be that, that will be very powerful and couldn't be uh, beaten down using uh, the police. Uh, well, we are still preparing it, but we will announce it in a couple of weeks. Danny, several people are asking about uh, the sources of your financial support and whether you accept foreign funds. We are very proud that we are... <clears throat> able to run on, on crowdfunding. Uh, we first started to crowdfund 10 years ago when Alexei Navalny launched Rospil, his initiative to uh, investigate corruption uh, during the like, government procurement procedures. Uh, he, I think he launched the first crowdfunding for Rospil even in 2010 and suddenly he was able to mm, collect about like 10 million rubles, an enormous amount of money by, by the standards of that time. I am very proud of the fact that I'm the first person in Russia who ever uh, used crowdfunding for political campaign when I was running for uh, 
uh, Ekaternburg <coughs> City Council uh, in uh, end of 2008, early 2009. I've got elected on March 1st, 2009. I was the first ever Russian uh, candidate running for an office to, to publish my bank account details and for like uh, online and uh, to, to, to call people to donate. And then when I got elected in March 2009, we started to adopt this strategy like more and more. We are the pioneers of political crowdfunding in Russia. We have crowdfunded over 100 million rubles for Moscow mayoral campaign of 2013. We, were, we have managed to fundraise over 4, 350 million rubles for the presidential campaign for the attempted presidential campaign of 2017. And we are now very happy and proud of the fact that we are still able to operate this way. We have like 35,000 subscribers who donate monthly, like who are subscribed to a monthly donations. The average donation is about 500 rubles, so it's $7. Uh, and we have about 200,000 people who donate like occasional, <laughs> like uh, once a year or something like this. So who are not subscribed for monthly payments, but still donate sometimes, mostly like reacting for some crackdowns or like traumatic events. This allows us to, to have like 250 paid staff uh, to rent offices, to pay taxes, <laughs> uh, to buy equipment, uh, uh, to run political campaigns and so on. Uh, we accept donations from Russian citizens only. So. Um, this question pertains to your um, comments with regard to the upcoming Duma elections and how you uh, are able to recruit um, candidates to run for office and whether or not there is uh, concern about them being in danger. This is from Nancy Becker. Uh, okay, look, uh, so first of all, um, our own candidates are important because uh, when we have our candidates run running and when they are not admitted to the ballot, this also creates a lot of, you know, protest and, and so on. But frankly, this is not the main part of our strategy. <clears throat> For instance, uh, back in 2020, during the regional and municipal elections all over the country, we have endorsed over 1,100 candidates altogether because it's our kind of public obligations that using the smart voting approach, we have to give an advice, we have to give an endorsement in every district, in every re regional election in the country. So in every district, we have to put our bid on someone who, in our opinion, has the best chances to defeat the United Russia candidate. And as Nancy has correctly pointed out, due to the high risks, due to the mm, enormous requirements for a candidate, uh, due to enormous Mm, enormously complicated procedures. It's like very complicated to collect the signatures that you need to qualify it, uh, qualify it to run. It's very complicated to uh, to raise funds. Uh, you have to open a special account in only one bank in a, in a state-owned Sberbank, <laughs> and then you have to 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 put money in this account for your campaign following a set of very challenging and ridiculous rules and so on and so on. We do not have our candidates queuing in a line. So, uh, so we have endorsed like um, over 1,100 candidates, but only a few dozens of them were like our candidates, were like sharing our uh, beliefs and ideas. And only a few of them were allowed to be on the ballot. 
and some of them also won. We we now have our candidates, so our Sergei Boyka, the head of our regional office in Novosibirsk, is also the member of Novosibirsk City Council, and it's the third largest city in the country. Uh, Ksenia Fadeva and Andrei Fatsiev, the employees of our office in Tomsk, are now elected members of Tomsk City Council and so on. But mostly, we do not have our candidates um, because no one volunteers or because uh, people are not admitted to participate. And we endorse uh, candidates that belong to some like quasi-opposition movements because in Russia, you know, technically we have like one ruling party and three like quasi independent quasi-opposition countries, which, of course, are always in line, always aligned with the, with the ruling party, the Communist Party, the Just Russia, and the uh, LDPR. But uh, still, when we endorse the candidates from those three parties, and when they manage to win, when they manage to uh, unseat the United Russian incumbents, then we win a chance that regional parliaments or in 2021, the federal parliament, become more competitive. So, United Russia's approval rating countrywide is now about 27%. United Russia holds over 75% of seats in, in the Duma, in the federal parliament. And pretty much like a comparable situation <coughs> also exists in every regional parliament. So it's just unfair. So it's just not representative a party with 27% popular support couldn't have uh, the constitutional majority. So helping minor parties, helping like quasi-opposition parties, even if our party is not registered, we attempted to register our party nine times. We applied nine times to Ministry of Justice and all our attempts were just... Uh, not granted for frivolous and ridiculous reasons. But even not having our own party and endorsing the candidates of those uh, 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 parties, we still managed to create more turbulence, more political competition, more um, unpredictability, so to say, within like local, uh, municipal, regional parliaments, and also we hope uh, in the state Duma this this fall. Uh, Leonid, so there is a question about uh, foreign sanctions from Victoria Langowska. Now that Biden announced his first sanctions against <clears throat> Russia, what is the Navalny campaign's reaction to it? Do you wish more countries will press down on their relations with Russia? Uh, Thank you, Victoria. First of all, let's be uh, uh, first of all, let's be precise with the language. Uh, we prefer, and this is also correct, we believe, not to talk about sanctions against Russia. These are sanctions against Russia's individuals, against criminals who are responsible for uh, poisoning and harassment and political persecution of Alexei Navalny for crackdown against the peaceful protests in Russia. So these are not sanctions against Russia. This is actually sanctions for Russia, pro-Russia, that actually uh, are intended to help the Russian civil society in its fight against Putin. Uh, we consider the sanctions to be quite a breakthrough <laughs> because even in fall when Alexei Navalny was poisoned with a prohibited chemical weapon there was a debate both in US and Europe whether or not there should be sanctions and the US administration, Trump's administration has chosen not to impose sanctions uh, Europe has decided to uh, uh, to announce some sanctions, but they were like not severe and so on, and targeted like quite random set of individuals. So, but the debate was if sanctions 
should or should not be applied. Now this is now this is gone, and this is important. This is a an important step forward, because now all the discussion was not about like if sanctions should be applied or not, but only about who should be on the sanction list. And that's important. It's it's a good step forward. Having said that, I'm of course not very much happy about the composition of the list. It could be much better. And as for instance, Senator Menendez uh, also uh, called today, oligarchs have to be sanctioned. Putin's wallets, Putin's... Uh, those nominal holders of Putin's assets. Money is something that's really essential, that's really important mm -hmm. for Putin. And money, this is something that could really create a leverage against him. So far, they don't see that uh, this, this round of sanctions doesn't really create a leverage for uh, Europe and US to, to talk to Putin from a forceful position they could they could have done better but we need to advocate for more sanctions against individuals we have to continue to explain that in russia there is not much difference between putin's oligarchs and putin's heads of law enforcement um, agencies they work closely together they play different roles, but they are parts of the same puzzle. And uh, I think that it's actually like possible to, to, to push forward. I think that it's actually like possible to get more people on this uh, sanction list and make it more, uh, make, make the consequences, consequences more painful for Putin. Thanks very much. Uh, this next question um, comes from Alexandra Birch, and it concerns um, the platform or the things that the Navalny campaign advocates for, and whether you could talk about your advocacy for migrants and the migrant crisis uh, and detention centers like Saharava, uh, <coughs> what the campaign's approach to those subjects is. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, first of all, um, let me be very clear that uh, our campaign's position has never changed on, on the issue of migrants from, like, back from, like, 2011, when we started to work together with Alexei, 2013, Moscow mayoral campaign, 2018, presidential elections, we advocate for a visa regime with uh, the Central Asia countries. So now uh, Central Asia countries like the former Soviet republics of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan uh, account for millions of uh, migrants who enter Russia without needing a work visa, a work permit, without any permit actually, which allows uh, those people who invite them to work in Russia to treat them as uh, modern era slaves on many occasions. Uh, they, like their, uh, their passports are taken away. They are forced to work in a like very bad conditions. Uh, they are put in some like dormitories with dozens of people occupying small rooms. Uh, they are paid uh, very small salaries and black salaries, no taxes are paid, and so on and so on. Once the head of national, uh, of the Federal Migration Service, uh, that was Romadanovsky, was asked about a number of work migrants in Russia, and he answered, well, there are between 5 and 10 million, which is, well, 5 or 10 is quite a big difference, and the, the guy is kind of responsible for managing the situation with migration and he only could give such an estimate which actually shows that well the russian southern borders are completely transparent no one knows what's happening and it leads to very dramatic consequences 
for for the migrants themselves and for the economy. Russian economy needs migrants. Russia is a huge and underpopulated country. We have to welcome to welcome very many migrants, but of course, this has to be regulated. So we have to issue visas, work permits. We have to know that this person gets a permission to come to work at this employer for this salary, this taxes are paid, and this is all kind of, uh, well, this, this is not a black market, not a black labor force market, but this is just a civilized, normal, like, thing. How, I mean, if I would like to go to, uh, as a Russian citizen, if I would like to go to, uh, to Europe, to US, to work, my employer will have to prove the local authorities that uh, they need me, that they can't substitute me uh, on, on the local job market. Uh, they will have to request uh, a visa for me and so on. The same approach has to be applied. Uh, the, 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 the first part of the answer to Alexandra's question. The second is that, uh, well, <clears throat> uh, the recent situation, uh, the, 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 the recent protests have kind of uh, stressed uh, this um, all this situation about the migrants in Russia because uh, when uh, they have arrested over a thousand people in Moscow only uh, on January uh, 31st of uh, 2021 they have sentenced them to this short term arrest like 10 or 15 or 30 days and the, this, the jails were overfull, and they decided to put them in this detention center in Sakharov and Higodivsk, which is actually built for the unlawful migrants expecting their uh, deportation. And everyone has seen that these migrants are treated like mm, wars and slaves. They're treated like below any threshold of humanity that they actually could spend like months and years in this detention centers like Sahara expecting uh, trial. Now when like 900 people from street protests uh, have been put to this Sahara concentration camp, uh, this has become very clear and very obvious for, for many. Maybe many people started to care uh, about it. We have uh, paid opinion to this back in 2013. This was one of the topics of uh, Navalny's 2013 mayor campaign. When Sabayan, the incumbent mayor, who wanted to kind of uh, appeal to his voters, he actually made a huge like police raid against uh, migrants in Moscow and has like sent them all to some kind of concentration camp uh, on the outskirts of Moscow. I'm not sure if it was Sahar or something else. And we were uh, advocating for their rights. So uh, uh, now this Sahar and Igorovsk uh, detention center is actually empty <laughs> uh, because, uh, because of the dramatic uh, drop in uh, Russian rubble uh, exchange rate. Very many, uh, recently, very many migrants uh, have chosen to come back to their countries. Very many mi migrants from Uzbekistan, for instance, uh, preferred Turkey over Russia uh, as uh, the country where to work. And actually the, the number of migrants in Russia decreased uh, quite significantly. So <laughs> this allowed uh, Mo Moscow authorities to, to put people in this detention center in Sakharov because it was quite empty because uh, there were pretty much like no migrants expecting trial. But in general, of course, the problem is not gone and Russia still needs a transparent, clear, civilized and lawful policy towards uh, migrants from Central Asia and other countries. Uh, 
we, we, we meet them, but we also need this to be regulated. Lani, thank you. Um, first of all, let me say that we have only 10 minutes left and a lot of oh, questions. Sorry. So if you could very briefly... I'll try, to keep, I'll try to keep my answer short. Thank you. If you could briefly respond to the question, which is kind of obvious, of course, and very related to the question about migrants, what is your reaction to the Amnesty International decision not to consider Alexei Navalny oh. as a political prisoner, as a prisoner of our oh, Well, it's 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 a big fail. It's it's it caused enormous damage to to Amnesty International itself. Uh, it's very clearly a mistake. First of all, like just a technical mistake. We, they they have sent us their analysis of his. Uh, Mm, statements of 2007 and this analysis was wrong I mean it was just I mean uh, it was just wrong I mean uh, um, so uh, they, they misinterpreted something there was probably they were a little bit lost in translation and they actually also uh, wrongly uh, use their own term of a prisoner of conscience because uh, let me quote it's it's quite important I think I mean uh, just a second um, uh, when when Peter Benenson the founder of uh, 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 Amnesty International has defined what is a prisoner of conscience uh he wrote back in 1961, quote, uh, just a second, just a very short second, because it's, uh, he wrote, uh, any, the, the prisoner of conscience is any person who is physically restrained by imprisonment or otherwise from expressing in any form of words or symbols any opinion which he honestly holds and which does not advocate or condone personal violence. So any person who is restrained for ex from expressing opinion which he holds and which does not advocate. So it's quite clear for me that uh, this refers the second which, which does not advocate for violence, refers to the opinion, not to the person. So it's not uh, the prisoner of conscience is a person who uh, expresses some opinion which does not advocate for violence, which is Alexei's case. Uh, they, they kind of um, try to put it this way, that he is a person who is now imprisoned for expressing an opinion, but as a person, in the past, he kind of advocated for violence, which is also not true. He never did it. But even in this case, they just like wrongly uh, applied their own uh, defin uh, definition. They were manipulated by, by Russian propaganda, by Russia today, uh, in very humiliating manners. They were like tricked and played with, uh, with, uh, with this like Russian pranksters and so on. A very, very humiliating story for, for uh, Amnesty International. I still believe uh, they have a chance to, to correct their mistake, but not the damage uh, that has been done. The, their leadership very clearly has proven that they're just unfit. They, they were not able to deal with this major crisis they have created and uh, a crisis artificially they allowed Russian propaganda to manipulate them so that's 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 all a very sad situation I would say um, thanks very much um, I will say that there seems to be a response uh, on the Q&A from um, a member of Amnesty International Genrieta Shobanova um, who actually commented um, and you can just absorb this comment without necessarily commenting on it, that um, in making the discernation, Amnesty focused solely on uh, the circumstances surrounding uh, Navalny's detention 
and we did not uh, consider some of his previous comments, which he has not publicly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, once again, this 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 is just wrong. I mean, just plain and simple. So first of all, he many times commented on his old videos of 2007 and explained uh, his position. The second, that the definition of prisoner of conscience is, and it's very logical, is that something is being imprisoned for his non-violent opinions for for his like and i mean navalny is imprisoned for the fact that he dared to survive the poisoning with novichok that he dared to investigate this poisoning attempt against himself and he dared to prove that it was putin behind the poisoning and then finally that he dared to build a big movement uh, against putin <coughs> and um, uh, to expose his corruption he is very clearly not sent to prison for his opinions or views or videos of 2007. That's first of all is enough to close this uh, discussion, in my opinion, just based on the on on the amnesty's definition of prisoner of conscience, but also in 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 very many interviews of 2011, 2013, 2015, and and so on, so on with a famous uh, series of interviews with Boris Akunin, famous dialogues with Adam Michnik of Polish Solidarność that have been published uh, as a book. He explained uh, his views on nationalism and on migrants and so on, <coughs> and uh, commented on these videos and many times explained what was the context of these videos of 2007 and uh, how they sounded in that context. And of course, they were never, never calls for violence. I see that someone just uh, have uh, sent the link to, to, to that video of 2000, um, to, to that old video. And that's that's good. I mean, anyone who, uh, who knows uh, Russian actually could watch it themselves and, uh, and, and see. So, 2007, 2008, have seen uh, an emergent young nationalist movement in Russia and have seen a very interesting Kremlin's attempt to, to weaponize, to instrumentalize uh, this new nationalist movement. Surkov, Kremlin's mastermind at that moment, tried uh, his best to uh, to create like to to, to use uh, these groups of young nationalists to Putin's favor, a presidential administration back in two thousand nine, for instance, created Born by Russian nationalists. The the and how to translate it, the the uh, fight brigade of Russian nationalists, a a group that has killed dozens of migrants, tens of them. And then they, after they were all like covered with blood, after they would face uh, very long prison terms if exposed, Surkov started to ask them to, to, to make also like political killings uh, in, in Putin's favor. They started to kill uh, judges, they killed the, the lawyer uh, Stanislav Markelov, who was associated with the Antifa movement, and so on, so on, so on. Then, when, when Surkov was gone, this, uh, the leaders of this movement, some of the leaders of this movement, have been charged with those mm, murders and uh, sent to prison, but only some of them, some, some of them, continue to be free. So, Putin used, uh, so there were, like, young nationalists, uh, and Putin's administration tried very much to, to, you know, to incite hatred against migrants, uh, to incite violence in, in, in order to use these young groups later as their like uh, killing squads or something like this. So Navalny was trying to address it, his most in famous video of 2007, this dentist video, clearly says that killing migrants, it's not 
the way to operate. You don't have to do it. We, we advocate <clears throat> for deportation of unlawful illegal migrants without application of violence. And we are against those who call for violence because it's the way how Putin tries to use them. And we want to show and to prove uh, <clears throat> that Putin is your enemy, that Putin is actually the beneficiary of this corrupt system that he's built, where, I mean, there is millions of unlawful uh, migrants in the country and they have to pay bribes not to be deported. They have to, to work like 16 hours a day for paying no taxes and, and so on and so on. So Navalny tried to reach out to those young nationalists to explain them that they have to turn their anger and their hatred not against migrants, but against Putin and the corrupt system he's built. And he actually managed to achieve some, some level of success. I, I recall managing his campaign for mayor of Moscow in 2013. I have seen in my campaign office some, I don't know, like young nationalists working together with LGBT activists because they had the idea that we have a common enemy, that we have to organize ourselves, we, we have to work together to defeat the United Russia candidate. Unfortunately, and I have to admit this, uh, the annexation of Crimea uh, has um, canceled the successes of this strategy because most of the nationalists uh, agreed that they are ready to forgive Putin everything because of, you know, like, protecting Russian-speaking people in Crimea, regaining the, 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 uh, like, the strengths of the Soviet Union and so on and so on. The majority of nationalist movement, unfortunately, allowed, to, to, allowed Putin to, to trick itself with, with the annexation of Crimea and our attempts to, to talk to them, to, to get the healthy part of this movement uh, uh, to, to bring it to the anti-corruption fight failed after 2014. That's true. That's true. But before 2014, it was a reasonable and sound political strategy. Uh, Lani, this is going to be uh, the last question, perhaps, and I will try to combine several questions. So Thomas Swift, Marjana, James uh, are asking about what other countries, the US, but also uh, the countries of the East and Central Europe can do to undermine Putin power and maybe help uh, the process of developing political freedom in Russia. And now I will also add to this a question from Ilya Vinitsky in Yuri Living. Is it probably now a significant part of your audience today are academics, uh, philologists, historians, and so on and so forth. So they are asking, what do you think scholars uh, in Russia and the West can do in order to help free Alexei Navalny from jail? What kind of support, educational campaign, advocacy will be most effective in your opinion? In your opinion? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you so much. And it's actually quite a challenging question because, uh, of course, we are quite sure that if and when change comes and happens, it comes and happens from inside. So, I mean, we are, of course, investing, so to say, uh, some effort into like foreign policy. We are going to Brussels. We are talking to American lawmakers. We are advocating for personal sanctions against Putin friends and so on. But still, all this activity takes like, I don't know, 10% of, of our time, of our... Um, of our resources because we realize that much more important is to, to call for change from inside, to, to build up the protest movement, to uh, ask more people to participate in the smart voting and so on. Th this will make a difference. Uh, a pressure from abroad could only help, but it can't be sufficient alone. 
still, I'm very sure that <coughs> if many people would join our campaign to uh, to to address their lawmakers in their countries to call for personal sanctions against Putin's closed circle, to go after Putin's money, it would be very helpful. Russia exports corruption. Corruption is much more important of export product of Russia than even oil and gas. So uh, Russia officially uh, by, by official data, uh, the, the, the flow of capital from Russia abroad is like 50 to 60 billion US dollars a year. And the majority of these funds is just money stolen from Russian taxpayers to identify those assets, to, to freeze them, to, well, to keep them safe before... Uh, one is able to return them to the <coughs> uh, taxpayers of the metaphorical beautiful Russia of the future is actually very important. And it's also very painful for Putin uh, if his assets or the assets of uh, his closest allies are finally uh, uh, identified and um, arrested. So we, we don't think it's hopeless. We, we think it's uh, an important advocacy campaign uh, that the West finally realizes how much of Putin's money are actually there in the West, mostly in Europe, in the UK, but also in the US. Uh, and how, how much leverage against Putin actually could be created if uh, these funds are identified and uh, if uh, sanctions are imposed against nominal holders of these funds. We have proven that Putin actually cares only about money. That, that's, that's, that's the main, ef that's the main uh, effect of, of this Putin's palace video. Uh, Putin's pal palace video is very important not because it's yet another expose of the corruption, but it's important because it's kind of a direct uh, look into inside into inside of Putin's head. The man had, had 20 years. He had an opportunity to fulfill any of his dreams. And we have managed to prove, to show that his actual dream was to have like, a lot of gold around. So that's 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 what's really important for him. That that's his weakness, and uh, we, we we should use it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, on that um, note, we have to conclude the discussion. Although there are a few questions remaining, and I'm sorry that we can't get to them, but um, I'm really respectful of the fact that it's a very late hour for you, Leonid, and. Um, uh, we're all deeply grateful for your time um, and participation uh, in this discussion. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, let our audience know that this uh, webinar has been recorded and it will be available uh, for you to look at again, uh, should you like. Um, so once again, uh, let me thank you very much for participating, Leonid, and thank you as well, uh, Katja, for co-hosting this event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting, for your questions. I'm very sorry that I... Uh, maybe yeah, because of the late hour, sometimes took too much time to uh, <laughs> ex explain myself and uh, for my, my English was especially uh, bad <laughs> at 1 uh, a.m. Uh, in the morning, uh, but hopefully we'll have a chance to repeat it offline soon. All of Princeton wishes you a great good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.